Hello folks, it's me, Demontropolis, and I'll be starting off Mega Man's 2nd NES Trilogy with Mega Man 4, a game released in 1991. If you've seen my Mega Man 3 review, you should know how troubled the development for that game was. But on the flip side, the developers of Mega Man 4 had very few problems working on the game. After the game's release, however, it's a bit of contention with how Mega Man 4 actually stands among the other Mega Mans, as while it was still praised as a success, there are very little improvements or innovations that made it stand out beyond just being another Mega Man game. Or at least, that's what people thought. Nowadays, Mega Man 4 has earned a respectable following among the community, some even making the bold claim that it's the best out of the NES Mega Man games. But what do I think? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. So without further ado, it's time to dissect Mega Man 4. Before I get into gameplay, we get an opening cinematic for the first time since Mega Man 2. This one first goes into Mega Man's origin story and how his new identity came to be from a housekeeping robot, making this the first game to actually explore it through a cutscene instead of being exclusive to the manuals. The music fits both sections very well, and we even get a cool shot of Mega Man standing on a train as it speeds him to his next destination. The plot for this game is that there's a new scientist in town, Dr. Cossack, who is following in Dr. Wily's footsteps with his own eight robot masters and Citadel Fortress. I like how his character introduces the concept of a fake villain, something which gets played around with in later games, as while you spend most of the game looking forward to taking down Cossack and his catcher, he's not actually evil in the end. Rather, the story actually pulls a plot twist, the first in the classic series. After you beat Cossack, Protoman appears to drop off Cossack's daughter, Kalinka, who reveals the truth. Kalinka was kidnapped by Dr. Wily and used as a hostage to coerce Dr. Cossack into building Robot Masters for him and fighting Mega Man. It's a pretty dark turn for Wily to be putting children in a hostage situation, and I think it's executed pretty well when you first find out about it. Too bad that Dr. Cossack and Kalinka don't show up in a later cutscene to officially make amends. So, knowing that Wily is behind everything the whole time, you have to storm his castle after Cossacks, and I think having two sets of fortresses helps expand the game's length in a more organic way than what Mega Man 3 did with the dock robots. The biggest innovation that Mega Man 4 brings to the table is that Mega Man can now charge up his Mega Buster. In addition to shooting regular lemons, Mega Man can charge it up to fire a more powerful shot that does 3 damage instead of 1. While not as much of a game changer as the slide was, it is still nice to have if you need to immediately smack a 3 HP enemy in advance, or get a head start on a tougher enemy. Contrary to popular belief, the Charge Buster is not actually OP in this game, as there are a good number of high health enemies that will take quite a while to beat with just charge shots, and the skinny hitbox dissuades Mega Man from relying on it against smaller and weaker enemies. Mega Man also gets a new ally in this game, along with Rush. While not usable from the pause menu, Eddie here is like a portable container, and shows up in the halfway point of five stages to give Mega Man a random item, ranging from a big health energy, a big weapon energy, a 1-up, or even an E-Tank. He's designed like a lottery where he could give you what you want, but other times he'll just be mean and give you the same useless item over and over and over. Which leads me to my main concern with Eddie. If you leave the room that Eddie is in without picking up the goodie he provided, he will just appear again and give you another item, meaning that this lottery can actually be rigged. If you want an E-Tank from him, just keep refreshing the room so Eddie gives you that E-Tank eventually. This behavior of rigging Eddie allows you to cheese both him and the pickup you get in a way that the question tanks for Mega Man 3 wouldn't allow. Going on to Rush, he retains all his forms from Mega Man 3, However, it's ironic that his standard form, Rush Coil, is actually the most buggy out of them all. It does work when you need to use it for its intended purpose, but playing around with it reveals that Rush unfortunately wasn't polished properly in this game. Walking into Rush without being airborne will automatically bounce you up. The Coil hitbox seems to be disproportionately shifted closer to cover his head and not his butt, and if you get hit by something while Rush is standing around, he immediately warps to your position and bounces you automatically. Thankfully, Rush Marine and Rush Jet have been improved for the better. 
Rush Marine, while still situational and only limited to two stages, works really well. This is thanks to the more open water areas actually allowing Rush Marine full movement across the screen and being able to take down enemies efficiently by simply lining up with them and gunning them down. It also helps that Rush Marine consumes less ammo and at a more consistent rate than before, and even the Moby Whales get hammered by Rush Marine. You can also fly above the water with Rush Marine, so that's a plus. In the previous two Mega Man games I covered, Rush Jet was an OP utility thanks to being able to fly in all directions. Starting with this game on, Rush Jet is only limited to flying straight forward at all times, with Mega Man having some control on adjusting his vertical movement. It's a great balance because while you can cheese some sections with it, you can't cheese everything with it, and that makes any sections allowing for Rush Jet use more satisfying to pull it off as a result. It's not just Rush that Mega Man can utilize as a utility, but there are two unlockable utilities that can be found in the stages themselves. The first of which is the Balloon Adapter, which creates floaty platforms in front of you in the same vein as Item 1 from Mega Man 2. Since Rush takes a good while to spawn in, having Balloon to get to places quicker can make it more convenient for some, and there are even some sections that only Balloon can carve a shortcut through. The second utility is the Wire, which is a bit awkward in control by forcing Mega Man to look up before shooting a grappling hook above. Not only does it pull Mega Man to the ceiling for quick transportation, but it can also be used to hurt some enemies and bosses. My only gripes are that it feels like the game is getting a bit feature creep heavy, with five utilities, and the two new ones both have a function that overlaps with Rush Coil. However, there is a bigger problem with the utilities. After Mega Man collects them, he not only gets all his health back, he automatically teleports to the stage's halfway checkpoint and resumes from there, regardless of where the utility was relative to it. The wires in Dive Man stage, in a seemingly random pit after the second Moby battle, and since the stage's checkpoint is behind this second mid-boss, you have to redo a bit of stage and fight Moby for a third time. The balloon is in Pharaoh Man stage, if you ignore going into the pyramid from above and head right, but this is still very early in the stage, so Mega Man collecting Balloon means an entire room gets skipped and ignored, which include the Takitentos, an E-Tank, and the intended introduction to the Mamiras. One of Mega Man 4's biggest strengths are the weapons on an individual scale. While some of them have the same trajectory of just going straight, not a single one is bad, and each bring their own strengths to the table. Flash Stopper is an improved version of Time Stopper from Mega Man 2, as Mega Man can not only use it multiple times, but he can also shoot during the duration and pierce through half-armored enemies like shield attackers. Drill Bomb is a powerhouse of a weapon that can also be detonated to still do damage in case it misses an enemy, and Ring Boomerang never dings off, always coming back. Pharaoh Shot creates a big ball of solar fire that protects Mega Man from vertical threats, enough to completely break certain sections and can even be aimed in the diagonals. Dive Missile homes in on enemies and it's quite strong and fast, but its tendency to circle around something instead gives it a chaotic tension. Dust Crusher and Skull Barrier are probably the weakest of the weapons, as Dust Crusher has a slower rate of fire and a surprisingly small hitbox compared to Drill Bomb, and Skull Barrier while being an actual shield that blocks projectiles and enemies, goes away after one hit and isn't useful offensively. Can't even block met shots for some reason. My favorite weapon would be Ryan Flush, a big screen nuke that can wipe out entire screens of enemies, but is balanced by having a delay before the attack actually happens. Despite all the weapons being good in their own ways, they collectively lean towards being OP and can very easily break the game's difficulty. This is thanks to Mega Man getting two screen-wide weapons that are very strong in clearing out waves of enemies, with Flash Stopper having an exploit. The duration of Flash Stopper can be delayed by sliding, making it last even longer and absolutely destroying parts of a stage, or even the entirety of Skull Man stage. Most other weapons only consume one ammo, and since every enemy in the game has a weapon weakness that can either one-shot or two-shot them, it's only a matter of picking the right weapon to be as efficient as a possible. I'll go more into detail later about how this becomes an issue, especially in the fortress stages.
Another big strength of Mega Man 4 is the level design, which is probably the best the series has ever seen up to this point. Overall, there is a lot of personality at display thanks to most enemies and gimmicks being unique to each stage and getting ample time to shine, even if they may not show up again in another section or another stage. Toad Man stage is probably the best showcase of this, starting out in a heavy rainstorm that pushes Mega Man back if he jumps in the air, then transitioning into subterranean sewers that filter the rain into rushing water, which affects Mega Man's movement not only in enemy combat, but also the second mid-boss fight. Another good mention is Drill Man stage, which is primarily a combat-oriented stage until the final room, where boulder dispensers are mixed in with levers that generate the floor ahead to create a difficult challenge with just the Mega Buster. In addition, this is the first game to truly add in split paths across levels. These can range from optional dead ends with big goodies like in Bright Man stage, utility grabs as mentioned before, or having the option to pick from two diverging paths like in Cossack 4 each with their own rewards. The enemies are also worth talking about, because they help take advantage of your weapon arsenal, and if you don't have the right weapon, they can very well put up a fight. Pharaoh Man stage drops players right in the quicksand to fend off against aggressive Sasarinus, while Hey Hayes provides support bombings, making for engaging encounters to kick off the stage. Skull Man stage is solely built around enemy combat, such as Super Ball Machine Juniors, whose cannonballs increase in speed every time they touch a surface, Skullmets, who are invincible from the back, and Skeleton Joes, who can only be killed with certain weaponry, otherwise they are disabled for a short time. However, there are some problems with certain gimmicks. Dust Man stage has these red square platforms, which form in chunks for Mega Man, but they can be despawned mid-formation if the player tries doing this section with Drill Bomb, which can lead to a lot of frustration. Same stage also has giant presses moving up and down, but they only lasted for a few screens and only one was at all threatening. Bright Man stage has two types of platforms that move in an arc, but the player never has much reason to move backward with the green version, and their movement wasn't used to do things that horizontally moving platforms couldn't. The mechanics behind Drill Man's Falling Rocks are awkward, with being able to spawn multiple by dancing around its trigger path, and the levers were pretty weak as a stage gimmick, as nothing interesting was done with them. However, out of the eight Robot Master stages, Ring Man stage is the most obnoxious, even though it could have been fantastic. The first area has these wall blasters, which attack you in uncomfortable angles from the get-go, then proceeds to throw a total of four mid-bosses across the length of the stage. There are Kabaton cues and Whoppers, each fought twice. With the former, you have to wait a very long time for the yellow platform to get into position, like six to seven seconds of Mega Man just being locked in place. The Whoppers are easily the worst mid-boss in the game, because their pattern is the only time where a charge buster feels forced if a weapon is unavailable, making for a rather limited encounter. It's a good thing the second one can be skipped by damage boosting. Outside of Whopper, the rest of the mid-bosses are generally well-designed. Although you do have to wait a long time for Capitan Q to get into position, this purple hippo has a unique setup. While dodging homing missiles, the columns below have to be shot down to lower the hippo into attacking range. And given these columns regenerate quickly, it could be quite fun and hectic. Eskaru lobs bombs and doubles the eyes as both a weak point and a surprise attack. The second fight also combines this pattern with rushing water to make for a good final challenge. And the whale, Moby, makes up for a smaller HP with fast homing missiles and a combo move of sucking Mega Man into a spike pit while raining mines. My only gripe is that I wish Bright Man stage had a mid-boss, because with Flash Stopper being such an easy mid-boss killer, the weapon would have been unavailable on your first visit fighting that mid-boss. Mega Man 4 boasts some cool Robot Masters, even though not all of them earn that title. You can't go wrong with Feral Man and his ability to charge up Balls of Sun. Drill Man has a straightforward design and becomes more dangerous when you realize he can shoot off his hands as explosives. Dive Man is based on a submarine and charges forward like a torpedo, even though it may give him motion sickness. Ring Man somehow makes Golden Rings look cool in action and Skull Man was so impressive to the developers that they scrapped an entire level just so they could restart it and devote it to Skull Man. Even the not-as-cool Robot Masters make up for it, 
with Toad Man being able to summon Acid Rain, and Bright Man blinding his foes with a quick flash of his light bulb. Unfortunately, the boss fights against these Robot Masters are some of the most exploitable and underwhelming since Mega Man 1, so buckle in, it's gonna be big. When I first fought these guys, I thought they were near impossible because everyone except Pharaoh Man does 8 damage on contact, a 4 hit kill for the uninitiated, and certain patterns appear to be set up to make players feel like they are impossible. Bright Man uses his light bulb to freeze Mega Man in a similar way that Flash Man would, but the jump attack is impossible to dodge while you are frozen. The only way to prevent this is to bypass three intervals in his HP that trigger the Flash Stopper, and doing this limits Bright Man to just jumping and shooting. Dive Man can be very aggressive to a blind player, but he becomes one of the easiest battles as long as the player keeps their distance and pretends that water doesn't exist. Same with Pharaoh Man. He has patterns that keep him on the move, but staying close to him increases the chance that he will use a charge-up attack that locks him in place. Plus, his weakness only amounts to just mashing him until he dies a slow, painful death. As for the others, Ringman has a strict pattern that he never deviates from, Drillman can spend most of the fight underground where the player isn't actually doing anything other than waiting for him to pop out again, not even his weakness can hit him, and Skullman is fully exploitable because he always waits for Mega Man to make a move first. Then there's Toadman and Dustman, the two most pointlessly trivial bosses that we have ever seen up to this point. All of Dustman's attacks are slow like he's the laziest couch potato you'd ever meet, and his vacuum attack only serves to suck the fun out of you every time he uses it. And if you're dying to Toadman, as in dying to a boss who can be kept in place forever without giving him a chance to attack, I oughta slap you. There's no getting around the drop in quality here and every Mega Man fan knows that the Robot Masters are the true stars of their respective games, so if all of their fights, as in all of THE faces of Mega Man 4, fail to impress in one way or many ways, especially in a series known for rematching them all back to back, you've got a disaster of an issue. That right there is the worst aspect of Mega Man 4. Moving on, the music of Mega Man 4 has some good tunes, and while it's not collectively good as Mega Man 2's or 3's OST, it does get points for trying new things. There's a unique approach to the percussion with songs like Bright Man Stage, Drill Man Stage, and Wily Stage 1 and 2 delivering more heavy hi-hats and snares to support their melodies. Then you have more traditionally fast-paced jams, like Dive Man Stage, Skull Man Stage, Pharaoh Man Stage, and the title theme that unfortunately gets cut off automatically. I also like the Siberian influence heard in pieces like the Stage Select and Cossack Stages, with Cossack Stage 1 and 2 being my favorite song in the game for nailing the atmosphere. However, there are some tunes on the OST that can get quite annoying or grating, to me at least. The password screen is up there for one of the most obnoxious songs of Mega Man history. Who in their right mind wants to come out of receiving a fun weapon to hear that? There's a jingle when you collect the wire or balloon, and it sounds pretty muddled. The boss theme is of the repetitive kind, but to the point of just sounding like white noise. This last bit is a hot take, but I can't stand Dustman stage theme. At least this game's rendition. Something about the intro's sliding note pitches left a horrible first impression to my ears that I can never recover from. Outside of music, the game's audio presentation is pretty weak in several areas. In the opening cutscene, the explosions that happen in the city cut off a melody of the song because it is used in the same channel space, which sucks because it's the only opportunity for you to hear this song in-game. Then you look at other games like Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse that managed to bypass this issue almost two years ahead of Mega Man 4's time. Proto Man doesn't play his whistle when he shows up, leaving the boss music to keep playing as Kalinka is talking. There's an obnoxious screech noise when you hit Wily Machine 4 with Ring Boomerang, a weapon that's intended for use as the weakness. The new sound effect for enemies getting hit is not as satisfying as what the previous games offered due to the impact being more subdued and sounding less like you're tearing through metal with each hit. Occasionally, it can even get grating at times. Lastly, the cutscenes have a knack for long periods of silence. 
After the first opening music ends, you get 30 whole seconds of awkward silence as Mega Man sits in his pod to get transformed, and it makes him struggling to open his eyes afterwards look goofy with the lack of accompaniment. Same with the cutscene of the Wily Castle blowing up. 30 seconds of that as well. While you do hear the explosions later on, the first half is just radio silence as you watch Wily's UFO take its sweet time floating up and away like a balloon trying to get high. There are also issues with the transition speed across rooms. It is really slow, almost like the camera was given a ball and chain for this game. Same goes for a boss's HP filling up just before the fight commences. Not just that, but the sound of the HP filling up cuts off all channels of the music, hyper-focusing your ears on this grating sound that isn't balanced by the buildup of boss music. And this applies to Mega Man just collecting regular refill pickups too. How did that get screwed up? But let's get back to positives. This is the Mega Man game that started to significantly improve the sprite work from before, and cemented that every mainline game going forward would look just as good if not even more so. The biggest praise here has to go to the visual graphics of the stages, which I adore. Brightman stage has these sun-like pillars illuminating on and off, using the black void to show just how vast this lightning control system is. Dustman stage starts off with these chainsaw-looking conveyors grinding up trash, then later on, you see heaps of trash inside the walls and floors and getting grinded up by the presses, and at the very end, the trash is being incinerated. Cossack Stage 1 also does this visual momentum well, starting off in the snow-filled forest, before working your way up to a darker sky and Siberian cities, and closing out to nighttime with hail breezing by the tower you climb. Speaking of Cossack, the fortress stages in this game actually feel like they have an identity, keeping up their quality much longer than the previous games did. I've already talked about the first stage, the second stage goes through the main halls and reveal that it's still snowing. The third stage has a cool auto-scroller outside in daylight, circling around the topmost tower of the Citadel. The final stage goes back to nighttime with a cool shot of the moon at the start, and has two branching paths that either take you outside again or keep you inside. As for the Wily stages, while they are more forgettable overall, they still have their moments such as the first stage being littered almost entirely with Mets of all kinds. Even the boss is a giant Met. Surprisingly, the Fortress bosses carry a lot of variety, easily surpassing the Robot Masters. The Square Machine creates a fun idea out of an entire hostile room and presents a good challenge when battling the weak point. The Cockroach Twins are two walkers that attack Mega Man while he's limited to small platforms, and the pattern differences among them keeps things interesting. Cossack Catcher is intimidating with his quick snatching speed always looming over the player, and his three-shot spread gives experienced players something to catch on to. I like to think of Taco Trash as a giant gachapon with how it attacks, and fun fact, you can use Drill Bomb to break these invisible walls that contact damage is attached to, allowing you to shoot the boss from behind for an easy victory. Wily Machine 4 is the first of its kind to sport a skull-based design, which always rocks, and the change in difficulty from Phase 1 to 2 is seamless but sentical. It's also amusing that you can actually kill Wily with Rain Flush, poetically soft-locking the game. However, the best boss award would have to go to Mothraya. Named after a kaiju monster, this jetpack insect uses its bulk to its advantage. While it distracts you with pot shots and its weak point barely rising out of buster range, it can easily surprise you with butt slams or destroying the floor with its proboscis. Eventually, Mothraya will start opening up bottomless pits, so the longer you take to defeat it, the more awkward traversal is going to get, especially when it hovers directly above Mega Man. These reasons make buster-only fights quite tense. The fortress stages overall just have one overarching problem. They spoon-feed Mega Man big weapon energy to an unhealthy amount, ensuring that even when using only weapons throughout a run of the Fortress stages, it'll be very difficult to run out of something before the rematches, and given the weapons in this game are strong and cost-efficient altogether, the difficulty can very easily be steamrolled. 
To list some interesting statistics, every Cossack stage has at least three big weapon energies, Cossack 2 in particular having six, and only one stage in the entire game has small weapon energy lying about. This one's a bit of a no-brainer, but Mega Man 4 improves upon the control scheme that was buggy and rough to wrestle with in Mega Man 3, almost to perfection. There are some issues here and there, like the charge shot sometimes not charging up even though you hold the button ahead of time, but for the most part, you are in full control. The pause menu has a graphical overhaul this time around. Rather than bring up a small tab in front of the stage, you're taken to a completely different screen that provides all the information the player needs and is visually pleasing with the red backdrop. Future games would continue this tradition of a dedicated pause menu because of how effective it is. The pause menu does have an issue, however. If you pause and unpause while holding onto a ladder, Mega Man just gets kicked off and drops. Granted, this did happen in previous games, but only because Mega Man did a little teleport in place after unpausing to change weapons, which gives you a telegraph in advance to snap back into action. Here, that animation is removed, silently dropping you to your demise if you're unattentive. This one is pretty minor, but you can't jump out of a slide while underwater. Instead, you just keep going forward, and yeah, that sucks, but I never found a reason to slide jump underwater anyway. This is the first game since Mega Man 1 that lets you revisit the Robot Master stages, which helps expand on the non-linearity. There is no reason to do so in Mega Man 2 and 3, but here, it's helpful if you missed an item or an area you wanted to explore, and the Robot Masters don't come back because, well, you destroyed them. Mega Man 4 is also the first game to start recycling unused content from previous games, which is always cool to see. To give a couple of examples, the chart shot introduced here was originally intended to appear in Mega Man 3, but got scrapped during that game's development, and Drillman's design was partially borrowed from a concept sketch of an unused Mega Man 2 boss. Ow! Was that an E-Tank? Oh god! Oh god! Help! Help! Whew. Okay, I'm good now. I wonder where all those E-Tanks came from. Oh right, this is Mega Man 4, the first game to stuff your face with E-Tanks. Like seriously, we're just drowning in E-Tanks at this point. With a total of 13 E-Tanks in the game lying around, the highest we've ever had so far, going up to 18 E-Tanks, if you cheese all the eddies in the game into only giving you E-Tanks, there are more E-Tanks to collect than there are boss fights. The only Robot Master stage that gives no opportunity for a potential E-Tank grab is Toad Man's, and ironically it's one of the better stages. And outside of Wily 4, every Fortress stage in the game has at least one E-Tank to grab. That's right, Cossack 1 hides it from you at the start, and Cossack 4 offers a second one if you take the lower path. Throughout the game, there are some cheaply designed enemies, such as the Pit Hoppers, known as Up and Downs, having no telegraph before they attack, which almost guarantees one death to a blind player upon first coming to Dustman stage. Some enemy placements seem deliberately made to troll the player, such as Wily 2's Prank Path, which has nothing but a very small box and the only thing inside is a Gary Obi who's guaranteed to hit you if you keep climbing. In Wily 3, the second room after the start has two shield attackers that immediately charge at Mega Man's direction, and unless you know where their spawn point is, it's very easy for them to smack you right away. And of course, jumping with freedom into this last room of Dive Man stage only serves to smack you in the face with spikes. So moral of the story, don't jump with freedom. Speaking of fortress stages, a lot of inherent flaws from Mega Man 2 stages get carried over here. The biggest one being that there are no boss checkpoints. If you die to the boss, you get sent all the way back to the halfway checkpoint, the only one in these stages. It's even more baffling because unlike the fortress stages in Mega Man 2, there are actually dedicated boss corridors here before you fight the boss, yet they don't have checkpoints inside them, only serving to waste your time and make you walk for several more seconds. Mega Man 4 even copies some aspects from Mega Man 2, but in a lesser way. The penultimate stage is set up the same way, having rematches with the Robot Masters followed with a battle against the new Wily Machine, which ends with Wily escaping and taking Mega Man to a new stage hidden from the map for the final battle. 
This one is a basement, where the only thing of note are Imorms that only exist for you to farm off weapon energy for the final battle, if you even need it. Whereas Mega Man 2's final stage built suspense with its complete shift in aesthetics and lack of any music or sound outside of the acid drops echoing throughout, Mega Man 4's final stage doesn't stand out in any way that makes it memorable. You just kinda walk forward in a straight line. As for the final battle itself, oh great, this starts the plague on humanity that is the Wily Capsules for the rest of the mainline numbered series. And the problem is these things almost universally do the same thing. Wily fights in a small pod that can teleport across a black background, and every time he pops up, he spams projectiles in all directions. The first of the capsules debuted here. And while the fight has an interesting idea of using the orb's flash to locate Wily, it's just so boring waiting for the orb itself to spawn in. Most of the time you'll just be getting cheap shot from Wily spawning on top of you. And the weakness of Pharaoh's shot decimates any challenge due to the weapon's design lending itself to hitting Wily easily, and it beats him in 5 hits. My final critique is that the ending is kinda whatever for not really having anything to it. Wily activates a self-destruct in his castle, but Mega Man just leaves. There's not even any closure to clearing Cossack's name. Mega Man just hops on a train and heads home. I mean, at the very least, Mega Man actually heads home, unlike a good few Mega Man games going forward. In the end, I have 23 pros and 18 cons, leading me back to my question at the start of the video. What do I think of Mega Man 4? To start, I have to say this was quite the interesting game to dissect. This is because when I first played Mega Man 4 way back, I actually really enjoyed it, even more so than Mega Man 2, and only recently I realized the reason. On a first playthrough, Mega Man 4 doesn't have any noticeably sharp problems, unlike all the other NES Mega Mans. But the more I played it over the years, the more I got bored of it, until I took too many steps back to look at the whole picture. The E-Tank Ubiquity was especially jaw-dropping. With everything that's been overlooked and undercooked, however, this is still an enjoyable game, and I assure you it delivers a solid Mega Man experience, even if it's not a stellar one. I was really close to giving this game a 6 out of 10 after learning everything I could, but I couldn't bring myself to. So with that said, I'm going to give Mega Man 4 a rating of 7 out of 10. Good. And that's the end of the video. If you like what you saw, consider giving a like and subscribe to my channel. As per usual, check the links in the description if you want more out of my channel, or want to join my Discord server, Demon Tropoland. For those seeing this video in 2024, here's hoping for a great new year going forward. I have a feeling it's going to be peak. My next project is going to be a bit on the smaller scale of things, an arcade game of the Castlevania series marketed as Haunted Castle. With that said, I'll be signing off. Take care, folks.